So uh, yes, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Uh, we will get started now with the session um, on the gender pay gap study in the Colombian banana industry. So we, where we will be presenting the results and recommendations of the study that was conducted throughout this past year. Uh, for the welcome on behalf of the World Banana Forum Secretariat, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Victor Prada, the secretary of the World Banana Forum. So Victor, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Camilla. I appreciate it. Again, I'd like to welcome to this uh, meeting. Today, we will uh, present the results of the gender pay gap study that has been piloted in Colombia and in the Colombian banana industry under an ongoing letter of agreement between FAO and Fair Trade Germany. Uh, the activities which have been supported locally by the Latin American and Caribbean network of Fair Trade small, small Producers and Workers, CLAC, began at the end of 2021, with the objective to, of enabling a deeper understanding of the extent, causes, and possible solutions to the gender pay gap and higher labor settings. The research has been conducted by the Anchor Research Institute and consisted on piloting the Anchor Gender Model, which has been launched and presented to the World Banana Forum members during a webinar of the Task Force on Gender Equity in October 2020 already, some time back. Um, two plantations with different settings were selected for the study, uh, including a unionized plantation in Yuraba region and a non-unionized plantation in La Guajira, in order to explore potential differences and similarities. So, Due to the nature of the study, the names of the plantations have remained confidential, as you can imagine, and the results that will be presented today will be done in an anonymized manner. To complement the research and data collection, the study also entailed interviews with local stakeholders to validate the findings, which we will hear more about today. A stakeholder watch workshop <coughs> was held for local actors uh, on the 8th of July, to present the preliminary findings of the study. So um, the World Banana Forum also extended the invitation to the Gender Equity Task Force and World Banana Forum members. This session that I've mentioned, the 8th of July, content on important inputs and questions from local actors, which we will also hear more about today, and which were considered in the final review of the study report. We are pleased to inform you that the study report has been finalized and will soon be available publicly. Today, we'll have presentation from the Anka Research Institute and the local researchers involved in the study to present the main results and findings. Camille, if you could kindly go to the agenda. Then, um, so first, uh, Marta and Richard Ankel will uh, provide the introduction and information about the, the Research Institute. Then we will talk about the methodology and results of the study by Salia Smith and Luisa Fernanda Bernat Diaz. Then we have a QA session, a discussion session. Right after we will talk about the, the good practices and recommendations by Salia Smith and Luisa Fernanda Bernat Diaz. Again, discussion and closing remarks uh, by the World Banana Forum Secretariat and the Anchor Research Institute will be provided at the end of the session today. So, so we would like to take this opportunity to thank all of those organizations involved in making this study possible, including their Faith to Germany, CLAC, and the Anchor Research Institute for their support and, and yeah, incredible efforts to materialize this activity. We would also like to thank you for your participation today and hope that you will find the results of the study insightful. And yeah. And we will also um, further encourage you to participate actively in the discussions and to raise any questions you may have during the session today. So with that, Camila, I think we are good to go and we can proceed with the agenda. Thank you very much and welcome again. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Victor. So I think we would like to give the floor now to Richard and Martha Anker to give a short introduction to the study um, before we go into presenting the, the methodology and the results. So Richard and Martha, please, you have the floor. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have this, these results presented. Um, we're, we're really excited. I mean, it's a, it's a new methodology. It's a new approach. And uh, 
this is the first public presentation of any results. So this is, it's important to us. And uh, it's just it's one of five pilots. So there are four other pilots that are in various stages of being completed, just to be realized that it's a, it's a pilot. And, and so the idea of our pilots was that we would try and have different industries like garments and different countries uh, and different agricultural products. So we're gonna be doing berries in Africa uh, and garments in, in, um, in Turkey, Bangladesh and Thailand. Just to give you, give you an idea. Yeah, I, so I'm gonna just say- uh, Go to the next slide. The next slide, that, just to give you some background on the Institute and then a little bit of background on the uh, methodology, but really little background methodology because Sally is gonna carry forward about uh, what's been happening and how, how, how it's been uh, developed by Sally and the lead. The so we, we we've now started an institute, uh, Martha and I, and we now have a staff of seven uh, people, and mo almost all of them are on this call right now. Uh, we also have a global network of researchers around the world, of which you will hear from two of them today, uh, in order to disseminate. And this is one of our main um, uh, points of our work is that almost everything is public. This this is a little bit unusual, and that some of these uh, payroll data are not always, not always public because they're sensitive information. But but almost everything we like to be public. So it was great to work with uh, World Banana Forum and and Fair Trade in order to try and get this out in in public because it is a sensitive area for some employers. Uh, you know, the, the idea is, our idea with our institute is that we're trying to shape public policy by providing public information and, and try to improve the life, the quality of life of, of workers around the world. Uh, and just that there, there are a number of people on this call from the Global Living Wage Coalition that we're co-founders of, and we still work very closely with them. And it's been an extraordinary uh, partnership uh, of knowledge and action to improve the, the effectiveness of wage wage setting, it's a it, it really is somewhat unique of, of having researchers work so closely together with standard setting organizations. And each of us has our our uh, let's say our ex expertise and 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 knowledge. Uh, and and so the merging of the two has been really very very um, effective. Next slide. Next slide, yeah. So the, just as, as, a, as a little bit of a quick thing about the background of it, Martha and I uh, have been working on gender for many years, not in the last 20 as we've been on, mostly on, on living wage issues. But prior to that, in our, in our earlier lives, we had done a lot of work on gender and, and inequalities. So it was an exciting idea of doing something new. And we thought it was totally justified as part of a living wage group because women's pay is less than men's pay almost everywhere in the world. There's always a gender pay gap. And, and women are concentrated much more than men are in lower paid wage employment. And so anything which raises the lower part of the wage uh, pyramid will help women more than it will help men. So, it, so living wage by itself is actually a, a, a very gendered idea. Uh, but that from our earlier work, and, and really it's, it's all, almost all work to date, it's been concentrating on the differences in gender pay gap, like there's a 20% gap globally, uh, for more, more of a higher level, like, like societal level of education, uh, uh, stereotyping, gender stereotyping, and societal levels that isn't something that employers can do necessarily do a great deal about. They're, they, they live within the societies. And so the, the idea of this whole project started with, with if employers were cooperative and would provide us with information about payrolls, their payroll data, we could look at that and see why there was a difference of uh, pay between genders. And then, th it recommend what could be done about it. And so it was to bring the, the whole idea of gender pay gap to the level at which employers have some ability to do something. Um, so 
that's that's really what it, what what it's about. And 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 to a good extent because of Sally, it was to try and make this uh, really a truly a sort of mixed method uh, approach, where. Um, you go in and, and also do uh, um, qualitative interviews with people at the workplace so as to not only see the, the, the raw statistics of you know, the pay differences because women say work less hours or they're in, they're in lower paid occupations, but also about you know, what you can do about it and what kind of um, uh, policies are possible. And that comes from some of this qualitative um, and interviewing and, and, and group discussions. So it's it's a truly a, a mixed method to have the, the the raw statistics, but also the what you could do. Uh, and so anyway, so I you know now I'm going to pass it on to Sally and to um, Louisa. Louisa to uh, carry it on. But just just to have to uh, first introduce them, and I just say that we really really feel fortunate to be working with them. Um, because they're really, as, as, as some, some people would call the best of the best, uh, they're not just good, but they're the best among the best that uh, so you'll see from this presentation. Uh, Sally is an independent research consultant. She's a gender specialist, obviously, for many years, and has over 20 years been working on global supply chains, um, including a lot in the banana sector. So. Um, the, the, I know in Ghana, for example, she did a study for us on living wages in Ghana that uh, was dealing with the banana sector in, in Ghana. Uh, and so, I mean, she's leading the development of, of the methodology in general and the other four pilot studies. But for, for Colombia, for various reasons, uh, language and other reasons, we're lucky to get Luisa, Luisa uh, Fernanda. Uh, she's been researching for over 20 years. She's the head of the research office of Columbia's National Institute for Evaluation and also head of the planning and budgeting office at the Universidad Jorge Tadio Lozano. My Spanish is okay. And she is uh, currently working at the Faculty of Economic Administration, Administrative Sciences in Bogota with a, a, a big emphasis on gender, gender issues. So I pass it on to Sally to carry on with the met to, to describe to us what we're what the exciting new methodology and then Luisella about the, some of the results. Thanks, Richard. Hi, everyone. Um, very, very happy to be here uh, presenting you to you today. Uh, with the, we've had a few different sessions with the World Banana Forum, but this is the important one, right? Because this is when we have some results. <laughs> So it's really exciting. Um, I'm going to just say a few words about the methodology for those of you who who haven't been in previous sessions. Um, and then I will just kind of set the context for the study in Colombia um, before handing over to Luisa um, to present the bulk of the results. Um, and then we will we will break to have some some Q&A before then returning to the recommendations. Um, Thanks again to everyone who was involved in, in making this study happen. Um, and particular thanks to the two companies that participated for opening their doors to us um, and being so open and generous um, with their time and with sharing data with us. Um, and of course, also huge thanks to the workers who, who um, also shared their experiences and, and their, um, their views with us uh, during the field work. So uh, next slide, slide, please. So this slide really just is a, it's a, an overview of the way we're thinking about gender pay gaps in this new methodology that we've developed. Um, so as, as Richard said, you know, the point of the um, gender pay gap methodology and the studies that we're doing is not just to measure the size of the gender pay gap, that in and of itself is of some interest, but it's really not very useful if you don't really understand why there's a gender pay gap. So when we're looking at the why, um, we are differentiating between what we're calling direct determinants and indirect determinants. Um, so the direct determinants are the things at the workplace or the sector that have a very, very direct effect on how much a worker will earn. Um, so this is 
things like the type of work that they do, the type of contract they have, um, how much time they work per act per day, per week, per month, um, what forms of wage payment they have, you know, whether they're paid piece rate or time rate, what kinds of benefits they receive, um, and other characteristics that are, that are specific to the workplace. So these are all things that can have a very direct effect on men's wages and women's wages. But behind those, there are a whole range of different indirect determinants um, that what most people would kind of think of as root causes. And those root causes can be at the workplace level or the sector level in relation to things like employment policies and practices, so recruitment policies, um, the workplace culture, um, the degree to which men and women are represented in trade unions and whether there's a collective bargaining agreement, all things that are very kind of specific to the work, workplace and, and can have a big influence on wages. Um, but outside of that, the kind of the next circle, if you like, um, are the, the factors that are at the society or the economy level that influence what happen, happens in the workplace. Um, and this is things like gender stereotypes. So when you think about the type of work or the type of occupations that men and women have, um, that's very much influenced by the kind of wider um, norms and stereotypes in society about what is appropriate work for women, what is appropriate work for men, um, and particularly around um, unpaid care work, so working in the home, um, who does the majority of that work and how is that work divided up. Um, but also things like the state policy and support for, um, for women's and men's education or girls and boys education, um, legal protections for women workers and for informal workers and um, other types of workers. Uh, to what extent does the state uh, provide protections that, that are going to influence the type of work that men and women do and how much they earn for that work? Um, as well as a range of other policies like around minimum wages and maternity leave, paternity leave and so forth. There are also indirect um, determinants at the global level. And I think this is something that we're, we're um, you know, quite unique in looking at because of our positioning at looking at global supply chains. Um, so, you know, we're interested in what are the supply chain dynamics and the market dynamics that are going to impact on wages. Um, that come down, you know, th through kind of pressures in the supply chain, for example, trade and investment policies that also can affect wages, as well as things like, you know, the World Banana Forum, the, the, the sustainable development initiatives, human rights initiatives that are that are influencing practices at the workplace. So all of these things we're trying to look at um, as a way to understand gender pay gaps in a particular workplace or a particular sector. Um, and, uh, you know, it does require a mixed methods approach. The bulk of the focus is on the direct determinants using payroll data, um, but we then use um, interviews to try and get to some of this kind of root cause analysis. Next slide, please. So as Richard mentioned, we have five um, pilot gender pay gap studies um, uh, either kind of completed, underway or about to start. Um, so we have three in clothing in Turkey, Bangladesh and Thailand um, and two in agriculture in Colombia Bananas and Morocco Berry sector. Next slide, please. So moving on to the, the study in Colombia um, and next slide. I'm just going to say a few things about the methodology because Victor also kind of covered off most of this. Um, so I think a couple of things to highlight. Uh, so we we were working with Fair Trade um, on this study, and so the selection of the two companies that took part in the study came from the pool that of, of Fair Trade certified companies, um, and we jointly developed criteria for deciding how to select those two companies. Um, we also did a review of the kind of published information and, and secondary data on um, wages and employment in the banana growing region of Colombia um, and also on gender dynamics in the country um, prior to designing the research, if you like, that informed the design of the research. Um, we did some preliminary analysis of, of the payroll data. So we, the companies were asked to send us um, some of the dates, their payroll data in advance of going out to visit the companies and the plantations. Um, and that kind of, again, allowed us to fine tune the methodology to understand um, what kind of data we needed to look for and ask, ask for. 
Um, so then we did visits to the plantations. Um, as has been mentioned, we not only collected the payroll data, we also did um, interviews with a cross section of workers as well as with managers. Um, and then we, after having done the analysis, we prepared a report for each company separately, uh, which was a confidential report for those companies. Um, and that gave the companies an opportunity to see how they were doing, uh, but it also gave them an opportunity to feed back to us anything they had concerns about or any provide any additional information that they felt we had missed. We then also did a validation with stakeholders. Uh, we had a really great workshop, actually. It was a, it was a um, hybrid workshop and we had really good participation in the room and, and online from stakeholders in the industry, um, from both trade unions and from companies in Colombia. Um, so that was a really important part of the process to get a wider kind of picture of, of what's going on in the sector and to just kind of sense check our findings against people's experiences more broadly in the sector. Um, and then now we're at the stage, uh, step eight um, of, of disseminating the findings and there will be, there's a very comprehensive report that will be made public. Next slide, please. So just uh, flagging up a couple of points. Um, as I said, these are two companies selected by fair trade. Um, they're case studies. Uh, we, we're not claiming that they're representative of the sector more broadly in Colombia. Um, having said that, from, from the validation workshop with stakeholders, we do feel confident that there is quite a lot of commonality um, in terms of the nature of the gender pay gap in, in the Colombian banana sector um, and in the kind of determinants that we identified, the main determinants we identified in the two areas that we were working in. Um, so while not representative, we do think that these findings are going to be relevant in, in, in other companies in the sector. Um, we looked at payroll data across a year and a half, um, not only for operational workers, but also for administrative workers, including managers. Um, so that period covered a pre-COVID pandemic period, as well as during the peak of COVID and post-COVID. Um, and it, that was really important because obviously we know that, that the, the pandemic has had a huge effect on wages in many parts of the world. Um, so that was really good to be able to look at wages over, over the course of time that, during that, that um, period. Um, I've already spoken about the confidential reports that we delivered to each company. Um, Richard talked about this access to, to payroll data. Um, I think that is what makes this a particularly innovative methodology and the study is quite innovative because it is rare to get access to payroll data. Um, and so this really gives you a level of detail that, that you just wouldn't find in, in, in previous studies on gender pay gaps. Um, we also, you know, feel very strongly that this mixed methods approach is particularly important for any study on gender. Um, you really do need to take a qualitative um, uh, approach to it as well as, uh, you know, getting the, the, the hard numbers, which are equally important. And then finally, what's um, innovative about our approach is that it enables us to um, analyze the proportion of women and men who have a living wage using the anchor methodology. Um, so this was quite a, quite a lengthy analysis in and of itself, actually, just to do a very accurate measurement of, um, of the percentage of, of men and women who have a living wage in, in the two case study companies. Next slide, please. So, just moving then on to the context for the study in Colombia. Um, so there's a couple of slides here based on um, national survey data. Um, and just to give a sense of what this area of, of Colombia is like in terms of employment and wages. Um, so this is for rural um, people who live in rural areas. And the chart on the left shows the labor force participation rates by gender. So this is the percentage of men and women who are in employment or looking for an employment. And what you see is that the size of the columns, um, the, slight, the size uh, that is in red, is, which represents women, is smaller than uh, the part that is blue, which represents men. Um, and this is effectively to say that men are almost twice as likely to be employed or looking for work as women. Okay, so, so just to, just to recap then, um, women are less likely to be in employment um, or looking for work than men, but there are some differences between the three departments where bananas are grown for export. So in Guajira, there's a higher rate of um, women's participation in work. 
Um, the, the chart on the right hand side relates to the percentage of workers who contribute to the state pension scheme. This is effectively um, an indicator of formal formality of employment. So if someone works um, contributes to the state pension scheme, um, they can be classed as being in informal employment rather than informal employment. Um, so we see from this chart that in rural areas, the percentage of workers who are in formal employment is very low. Uh, between around 8% and 25%. Um, the percentage is slightly lower for women, but it's also very low for, for men. Um, and that's really just because in the banana sector in Colombia, what we find is that almost all workers are in formal employment. So they're already forming kind of a minority, if you like, compared to most workers in the region. Next slide, please. So... This slide is just to give you a bit of a taste of what we know about wages and the gender pay gap in the banana growing region. Um, so for the three departments uh, that we looked at, when we look at average wages for everybody in rural areas in those three departments, uh, we find a gender pay gap of between 21% and 30%. Again, there's some differences between the three departments. Um, with a slightly bigger gender pay gap in Antioquia than in the other two departments. Next slide. So then finally, just in terms of setting the context, um, the, the, the wage system in any study, all of the pilot studies that we've done so far on gender pay gaps, but also other living in the living wage studies, um, the wage study uh, the wage system varies very much from one sector to another, from one country to another, um, but also even between workplaces. Um, so what we find in the Colombian banana export se sector is that across both of our case study companies, but generally in the sector, um, there is piece rate pay for um, operational workers. That's workers involved in, in production and packing. Um, and salaries, monthly salaries for administrative um, workers, including managers. Um, there is group-based uh, remuneration for workers who are involved in harvesting and packing. Um, so that means that the productivity of the harvesting and packing team as a whole uh, determines how much individual workers will earn. There is also use of what's called um, a special shift or uh, it's jornada especial in Spanish. Um, it's a contract which allows flexibility in the number of days worked. And that's really because um, most plantations are not packing every day. Um, and so they need the workforce size to be um, flexible to adjust to the amount of production demand. There were, as well as those general um, uh, commonalities across the two companies, there were some differences uh, between the case study companies because one was part of an industry collective bargain bargaining agreement between Algora and Sintrainagro, and the other just had a company-specific collective pact. Um, so not it's not a unionized plantation, but it does have a collective pact, which um, sets out terms and conditions and wage rates. So those, the differences in those two agreements meant that the piece rate value for each activity varied between the two companies. The number of days that were guaranteed for special shift workers varied. And for the collective bargaining agreement, um, special shift workers have a guaranteed three days a week of work, whereas for the other um, company, there was no guaranteed number of days. Um, the basis of the group pay group-based pay differed between the two companies, um, whether or not harvesting transport to the pack house and pack house were all considered as one group or two separate groups. Um, and then there were also differences in terms of the kinds of benefits, um, extra legal benefits, so going beyond the law um, that, were, that workers had access to through the um, collective bargaining agreement and collective packs. Um, in addition, the collective bargaining agreement um, has some provisions to promote gender equality and try and increase the amount of the number of women working in the banana sector. So that was also a difference in terms of context. 
But there were other differences that weren't just about the uh, collective bargaining agreement and the collective pact. So there's differences just because of the location. So differences in the labor market dynamics in the two regions um, and differences in the cost of living. These things are all um, affecting wages as well as these kind of more direct influences on wages through collective bargaining and, and other types of wage agreements. So at that point, I'm gonna hand over to uh, Luisa to present the results. Uh, thank you, Salali. Okay, so uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, well, the first thing we looked at was the gender composition of workers. Um, one of the advantage of the payroll data is that it allows us to separate them between administrative and operational personnel. And this slide is showing the, the results. Um, the bars in the left uh, are showing uh, the results for operational workers, which are very similar to uh, the 12 and a half percent reported from previous studies for the sector. Uh, but the first uh, interesting finding from our methodology is that the proportion of women at administrative positions, which are the bars uh, at the right, um, are different between uh, plantations uh, are, and are also high, especially for company A. Um, this difference, um, it's related to the fact that both companies had headquarter offices in the capital of the department. So the administrative tasks are shared uh, between headquarters and the plantations themselves. So um, they are not strictly comparable, but it is interesting the high um, proportion of women that are working, working directly at the plantations at company A. Uh, next slide, please. When we look at the gender profile of workers, uh, we find some positive aspects that we want to point it out with this slide. Uh, the first one is the higher level of employment for men and women between 41 and 50 years of age. Um, it is also important to know that more than 60% of women and 50% of men are between 31 and 50 years of age in both companies. Um, and also, uh, half of these workers, uh, in case of company B, are between 41 and 50 years old. Uh, a high proportion of these workers in both companies have a permanent partner. And the average number of children is similar at both companies, is like 2.5 children uh, per worker. And also, um, despite the, this high um, proportion of workers with a permanent partner, there is a relatively high proportion of single mothers as well. And this is positive because um, this is uh, evidence of non-discrimination in access to employment for these single mothers. Next slide, please. Um, when we disaggregate the information into occupational groups, we find some differences between both companies. Um, if we look at operational workers, which are the first four categories uh, for each of the graphs, uh, we verify something that is already known for the sector, and that is that women are segregated into packing and cleaning activities, uh, while men do field and packing activities. Um, one of the things um, that we found very interesting uh, from the visits uh, at the plantations is that it is a common practice in the sector to promote workers to be multifunctional. So they are in constant training of their current activities and other activities um, so they can be rotated between them when it's needed. Um, for women, this multifunctionality is reflected in packing activities, but for men, it is reflected not only in packing, but also in field activities. And this explains in part uh, the differences in the higher proportion of workers in packing for company A when compared with company B. Um, in terms of the administrative uh, task force, we also see differences that are related uh, to what I said before about uh, the different composition of the administrative 
administrative activities that are, are done in the plantations. Uh, when we look at the type of, of contracts, another positive aspect that we can highlight uh, is related uh, to the fact that most workers are on permanent contracts. But this uh, is also related to the selection of these companies uh, for this study. Um, we also find that only 20% of workers are on fixed contracts and both companies use uh, the special shift contract um, where women are most likely to be because of its design for packing activities. Next slide, please. Um, one of the advantages of having uh, payroll data to do this analysis is that it allows us to differentiate the size of the gap between operational and administrative workers and between different types of payments that are, um, and these are the results that I'm going to present in the next slides. In this graph, uh, we see the average annual gap for operational workers at both companies. Uh, the first thing to show is that company A has a higher gender gap than company B when, when we look at 2020, uh, or if we look at the first six months of 2021, or if we see uh, through the whole period. Um, these gaps are higher and annually more variable than the ones found at company B. Uh, and something that is worth mentioning here is that company A uh, pays on average higher wages. Um, so this is a very important result in terms of gender because um, this means that better payments uh, do not necessarily behave equally between men and women. Um, also, uh, this variability uh, between 2020 and 2021 in terms of company A is related to the fact that when we looked at the number of days that women work, um, we saw this uh, month by month. In 2021, women work more days uh, than men in 2021 than in 2020. So um, this, I'm going to say this later on again, but uh, if we can guarantee more days uh, of work for women, uh, these gaps uh, will tend to reduce. Um, in the next slide, we include information uh, for both operational and administrative workers, and the picture changes completely. In, uh, as we saw before, when we consider only operational workers, uh, what we found is that company A have higher wages, but when we introduce administrative uh, workers, uh, the gender gap reduces by more than a half uh, and increases like 2% point, 2% point, this, ah, sorry, percentage points uh, for company B. Um, and this is because uh, they have more women uh, working in administrative tasks. And as Sally mentioned before, uh, they are paid uh, similar uh, salaries between men and women in administrative uh, activities. So with this uh, information in mind, uh, we search the data to identify potential direct determinants of these gaps. Um, Exploring, uh, next slide, please, sorry. Uh, no, uh, sorry, okay. This is a summary of what I said. So if my English is uh, too bad, uh, this is the, the summary. In both companies, women consistently earn less than men on average. Um, the size of the gaps varies a lot month per month. This is something that you can see in the report uh, with with other graphs that we do not bring here. Um, but this is a correlated with fluctuations in production and market demands. And also uh, COVID-19 is in between uh, our period of study. So uh, it also has an effect. Um, as I mentioned before, paying higher wages do not necessarily imply that the gap, that the gender gap is lower. And for our case studies, uh, this is really evident when we see uh, the behavior of this gap uh, for operational workers. 
Um, and the other interesting thing um, that we find at, that is not common um, in this kind of studies is to see the differences in the gap when you include uh, not only operational, but also administrative workers. And in this case, uh, the inclusion of the administrative workers uh, reduces the gap uh, for company A, but increases the gap for company B. Uh, and the other important uh, finding uh, is related to living wages. Uh, we wanted to see uh, with this uh, wage levels, uh, the proportion of men and women that could achieve a living wage. And if there is a gender gap, obviously uh, women are less likely to achieve a living wage. So um, what we find is that 94% of men can achieve a living wage um, with the current um, wage structure and 77% of men in of women in both companies um, achieve a living wage. And this is um, a very important result because uh, if you wanna promote um, that these companies pay living wages, um, they have to, uh, make adjustments so they can see this through a gender lens. Luisa? Tell me. Sorry, I just have to interrupt you, sorry. Yeah. Um, that result on uh, the living wage is for company, it's just for one of the companies, not for all workers. Oh. Not for both companies, is... it was just for one of the companies. Yeah, correct. For the other, yeah, you have, you are right. Uh, in the other company, uh, there were no uh, workers achieving that uh, living wage. Correct, Sally. Okay, so um, next, um, we exploit the benefits of the payroll data to identify those uh, direct determinants of the gender wage uh, gaps, uh, and we see it. Uh, at least in three different ways. Next slide, please. Uh, we see it in terms of the activities performed, uh, then in the different types of payments that uh, workers can have, uh, the amount of time work, and, the, and here we have a big difference with traditional quantitative works because uh, we usually like to see uh, this amount of time measured in hours, but um, here because of the uh, ways of the different ways activities are done um, in the banana sector, uh, these companies do not recall the exact number of hours. Uh, they actually work on a regular um, day. They only have track of the overtime payments. Um, we also look at the types of contract and we um, use age as a proxy for experience. Um, in these two last cases, we are not going to show you uh, the direct results, but you can check them on the final report. Uh, so next slide. In terms of the activities performed, uh, what you are seeing in these graphs are the average annual salaries for men and women, red for women, uh, blue for men. And we can see that um, uh, in all of the activities that women participate, uh, with the exception of cleaning for company B, which is a very small group, um, in general, uh, women are less uh, than men. Uh, as I mentioned before, in company A, the level of wages is higher, so uh, these scales are not strictly uh, comparable between companies. Next slide, please. And um, here we do a very interesting exercise exploding the information of the payroll data. Uh, in the last two columns uh, of the slide on the right, we have the average gender pay gap as I presented you a couple of slides before. And what we do is we disaggregate the information of the payroll data into the regular payments, which are the two uh, first bars on the chart. 
and compare it uh, with uh, the, the complete gap, including all types of payments. Uh, these are overtime payments uh, and also bonuses and allowances that uh, are of free access to all the workers uh, without considerations of um, specific characteristics. These are the general ones. So when we see this chart, um, if we only looked at the regular payments, excluding overtime, uh, these bonuses and allowances, we see um, smaller gaps for both companies uh, being um, the narrowing of the gap higher for company B than for company A. And we see uh, in the bars in the middle, um, the behavior of the gaps just for overtime pay, which are the uh, second group of bars of the chart. Uh, and what this shows us is that overtime payments do influence uh, the gap to be bigger uh, when you see it complete, the complete picture of uh, wages. And also um, there is a difference between both companies in terms of the bonuses and allowances that um, women and men are allowed to, to earn. Uh, one important thing that we got from the stakeholder validation is that uh, women are reluctant to accept overtime um, because of their double journey between home and, and uh, work. Next slide, please. Another thing we looked at was the number of days work uh, for both men and women. And when, what we see here is that women on average work less uh, regular days, uh, one day less. And uh, they also have more uh, sick leave days and pay leave days in general. So when we add these three facts and add it to another fact uh, that is stated here in the gray uh, rectangles for each group is that uh, women do less days uh, with overtime as I mentioned before, because they are not willing to do them because of their double journey, uh, they have more sick leave days and more pay leave days. So if you put this all together, that means uh, that uh, they're earning less because these sick leave days and pay leave days are uh, paid at a lower rate than, are, than regular work days. And the picture is uh, similar for company B. Uh, the only difference that we find in the next slide is that for women that have fixed terms, uh, they work one day more uh, than the rest of the groups. So uh, in the report, next slide, please. Um, you would also find um, that we calculated uh, gender pay gaps uh, depending on the types of contract that uh, the workers have. Um, and although we find some differences, uh, we really believe that those differences are more associated with the three things that we uh, saw in the slides before, uh, which are the activities performed, the different types of um, uh, payments that they have, which are overtime and bonuses are allowances, and the differences in this uh, time work and uh, leave uh, payments. Uh, in terms of experience, um, these um, companies do not have a complete record of the experience of the worker. Uh, ex uh, mainly the previous experience uh, before they got into their, their companies. So what we did was to um, correlate uh, salaries and um, age to see whether there was this traditional inverted uh, U uh, related experience and wages. And what we find is that um, 
there was not uh, this uh, evidence of an inverted U, uh, but um, a flat line uh, which shows no correlation between age and, and salaries. And what we, um, and the explanation for this is basically that experience is a condition for access uh, employment into these companies, but is not remunerated uh, higher, but um, in a fixed way uh, because of the uh, way they have structured the uh, peace uh, rates for each of the activities. Um, so this is the information of the uh, quantitative data. And we mix this information with field visits in order to identify uh, indirect determinants of these gender pay gaps. Next slide, please. And um, for this, uh, we previously we have previously list, uh, previously done um, a desk. Uh, work in order to find um, some um, works uh, on this issue uh, for the Colombian region. And we find a 2004 study uh, published by the uh, National Union School, uh, where 60 women uh, workers from Uraba were interviewed. And the findings back then was that 90% of them experiential, experienced a differential treatment depending on age, looks, or their personal relationship to the coordinator. Um, also, 75% of them reported not to have time because of the double journey to participate um, in different associations or committees um, to uh, have a voice on their own, how to improve their work conditions. Uh, and despite being um, 18 years old, this study uh, helped us to understand it as a baseline to see what has changed and what is uh, constant in terms of this uh, workplace culture and gender norms and stereotypes. Uh, so in terms of, um, workplace culture, one of the things that must be mentioned is that uh, since 2015, there is a new regulation that um, makes companies, uh, that forces companies to have offices of, of occupational health uh. and safety. And these offices uh, train workers in order to, to reduce uh, their uh, activity risks, and also uh, they work in promoting a better uh, working environment. And what we see from the interviews is that uh, this actually improved uh, the perception of men and women being equal at the workplace. So uh, in both plantations that said we are equal and they re uh, workers repeat this as a mantra basically. Um, so that's a first sign of, of improvement. However, um, when you, uh, when you um, began the interviews, uh, something uh, really uh, particular happened to us. In one of the plantations, um, we were really close to the pack house and workers of the pack house uh, used to put uh, music very loud. So if they want to communicate to one another, they ha basically have to yell uh, in order for their voice to be uh, here above this loud music. And when we were doing the interviews, some of them began to talk and we, the women we were interviewing noticed this and said, you know what they're doing? They are suggesting that we should get back to our work. and. Um, for younger women, this was not a problem and they ignore it, but for older women, uh, it was an issue and they say, well, 
they have already been interviewed. So why don't they respect uh, our time uh, doing this interview? What are they afraid of? Um, so this is to say that despite um, the promotion of equality in the workplace, there are still some issues to work uh, with uh, workers because in practice, uh, they do not feel like they are equal and they are asking women to uh, either do not take all the time uh, they actually took on our interviews or to do something more in terms of their work. Um, also, um, in terms of representation of women in different associations, what we find is that it is still very difficult for women to be part of uh, these uh, company committees uh, or representative uh, in the case of the unionized company to be uh, a voice uh, representative of the company at Sintra Inagro. And the reason is not that the administration do not promote um, women for these positions, but they still feel afraid or think that um, men would not um, let them speak for themselves in this kind of committees. Um, another, another finding was that um, it is very important, the work of Sinta in Agro in trying to solve all these issues. Um, in the unionized uh, company, uh, it is clear uh, in the collective agreement uh, the idea that the company must work to improve the, the gender balance uh, of their workers and uh, they promote the hiring of new women workers uh, when they have enough abilities to do the job. And this is very important and this is a first step towards gender equality. However, um, one step further would be to monitor how these new hires behave in time. And so far, Sintra Inagro is really concentrated of improving uh, women employment uh, in the sector, uh, but in the future, they have to also monitor uh, the how stable these new hirings are. Uh, I don't know if I am missing something uh, here, Sally. Maybe, maybe just to mention um, the limitation, um, the third bullet point down, uh, that we found that women oh, had you. previously, um, some women had, pre one of the limitations which Louisa has, has spoken about is that women don't engage in um, field activities um, and field activities are generally paid at a higher rate um, than the kinds of activities that women are engaged in. Um, and when we kind of interrogated, you know, the reasons why women don't engage in field activities, there are various reasons, including the gender norms and stereotypes around this type of work. Um, but there was some, um, some women who said that they had previously worked applying fertilizers uh, and we were told that um, that wasn't allowed by the certification standards um, because of the risk to reproductive health. Um, but it seemed from conversations with experts in the sector that actually that was maybe a misinterpretation of the standard. Um, and it's something that needed to be clarified with companies. Um, and with the certification standards to identify when um, or what kinds of uh, safety measures need to be in place to enable women to participate in those activities should they wish to do so. And I think that's probably sufficient. Uh, just one little thing extra. Um, when we validated the results with the stakeholders, um, we find something that was not evident in the interviews with these companies and is that uh, episodes of sexual harassment are still common in the sector. Um, they, are not, um, they were not reflected in our interviews, but our stakeholders all raised their hands and said, uh, 
there is still this is still happening and we have uh, some more work to be done in this area. Uh, so these are basically the results we wanted to share with you. Uh, I don't know if uh, we need something else, Sally. No, I don't think so. Okay. So now um, it's time for the public to pose all the questions you have. Hopefully my English is good enough to be understandable for all of you. But if not, we this is the chance to clarify uh, all doubts that you may have. Yes, thank you, Luisa and Sally. I see there's a hand raised here, Ana Maria Benitez. Um, no sé si esa era una mano levantada desde antes, señora Benitez. Your hand is raised from before. Okay, la bajo. Okay, so I see that we have, I believe it was Margarita Romanelli first. So Margarita, please go ahead. Hello, hello to everybody. Thank you very much for um, the presentation, very interesting. Um, I have some couple of questions, very short, uh, regarding uh, the methodology. If how many women uh, were interviewed uh, directly? Uh, and if uh, you think that uh, those interviews uh, give you the opportunity to verify what uh, is written in the payroll, uh, it, it is confirmed by the reality. And uh, on the other uh, end, that is very, very much uh, connected. Uh, if uh, you um, have uh, discovered um, that uh, as a Salary gap, there is uh, can can be affected by this uh, inexistence of a gray zone, mm, and uh, I mean with the gray zone when uh, the the salary is uh, uh, correlated to a certain number of hours or days uh, that you find the in the payroll, but into the reality. People, uh, the women, uh, has to work uh, uh, much more days uh, or uh, or um, or hours, and in that case, uh, the the salary gap uh, is higher. Uh, it happens, for example, in agriculture in Italy. That is a problem. Uh, so then, I would like to understand if there is also in that contest. Um, and uh, the last question, sorry for many questions, the, la the very last question is regarding if you have uh, found out any correlation among uh, the status of maternity, the status of to be a mother with uh, a salary gap. So if uh, there is any correlation among uh, these two categories, because uh, in another research uh, in Italy among uh, migrants, women, there is a, a correlation. Thank you very much. So it means that the, the women that are mother are much more exploited than the other in our research. Thank you. Sally, would you get that or? Uh, I can answer some of it. Um, so let me just, and then you can, then you can also um, add on. Um, so in terms of the number of women interviewed, I mean, there aren't, the number of women um, in each company is actually very small. Um, mm -hmm. And Luisa, sorry, you'll have to remind me. I think you interviewed all of the women um, at each All company. of the women that were working that day, but yeah. that was a, a low demand packing day. So not all workers were there, uh, but I think we interviewed like 16 women per day on average in at both plantations and uh, and just in terms of whether that was an opportunity to verify the payroll sufficiently i mean i'm not quite sure if you're asking whether we whether we had any reason to doubt that the payroll data was reliable um but no and, and the answer to that is no 
there, there was no reason to suspect that the payroll data was in any way manipulated, which is a common thing, you know, in, in, in many countries and many sectors of double books. And, but, but there was no reason to suspect that in, the, in this case. Um, the, whether the gender pay gap was affected, um, I wasn't 100%, I'm not 100% sure I understood your question, but I think you were asking whether if we were able to take into account time worked, uh, whether effectively women were working for less per hour um, than than men. I, I, I'm not sure if that was what you were asking. No, perhaps you could just repeat that bit of, of the question, but I'll just come to the last thing. The correlation between motherhood and, and the gender pay gap, we didn't find a correlation. Um, effectively, almost, I mean, as, as um, Louisa presented, um, almost all workers, both men and women, um, had children. Uh, which was interesting because of the kind of age range that we were looking at, you know, most of them were in the kind of middle 26 to, to kind of 40 type range. Um, and most workers had had um, children. Um, and so there wasn't a correlation there um, that we found that was associated with um, parental status. Louisa, uh, Louisa, do you want to add anything to that? And I don't know if you understood the second question better than I did. <laughs> yes. Uh if I understood correctly, uh, the other question was related to the days or hours and the correlation uh, with salary. Uh, what we did was to look at the number of uh, days per month that men and women were um, working. And um, you can see this in the complete report. And then uh, we compare it with the uh, wage gap. And what we can see was that for those months uh, where women work more days, uh, the gap was reduced and even reduced to zero in one of those months. But um, this is also related to demand. If you do not have uh, packing activities to do or if the level of packing activities is low, um, given the way uh, that these uh, persons in packing are remunerated, it is different to reduce the gap. But what we do see is that the more days uh, women work, uh, the gap is reduced. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, my question were very much uh, close to the, to the risk that there were uh, some uh, days uh, or hours uh, not uh, considered uh, calculated into the payroll. So in that case, uh, of course, uh, the salary gap would have been increased. Um, but uh, since you replied me that there is any risk uh, uh, or any doubt on this uh, uh, risk uh, relating uh, the possibility of having uh, some uh, days not uh, accounted uh, into the payroll, so then, uh, this question doesn't make sense. So my question uh, uh, doesn't make, make sense. So then uh, thank you for the adding uh, some other elements uh, with your place. Great, thank you, Margarita. We will move on then to the next. I see there's four other hands raised. So mm -hmm. first we will give the floor to Adela Torres and Senor uh, Emerson Aguirre, and we can continue with Cesar and Iris. Uh, Senor Adela, por favor. Hola, muy buenos días. Yo soy Adela Torres y soy dirigente sindical de Centro Inagro en el sector bananero en Colombia. Eh, pues mirando el estudio que se ha realizado a través de esta consultoría, vemos varios elementos que de pronto voy a permitirme compartir. Sí, lo que dice es, eh, en el tema del estudio, que las mujeres son menos que los hombres, eh, eso es cierto, pero en el tema salarial, también con el tema por la misma jornada y algunos contratos que se tienen, por ende se gana quizás menos que los hombres, pero no es porque la mujer tiene un precio diferencial en el, en el trabajo, sino que eh, es por los días de trabajo, como ustedes lo explicaban, por los días de trabajo que se tiene, entonces 
eh, por eso se gana menos, pero el, digamos que el día de trabajo en un empaque las mujeres eh, van a ganar igual que los hombres, no ganan las mujeres por decir algo 20 dólares y los hombres 25 no, ganan, si son 25 todos ganan 25 la diferencia es por los días de trabajo y lo decía en tu presentación, bueno, porque las mujeres eh, a veces prefieren es un sistema que tenemos especial con el sector bananero, eh, tema de contratación especial, así se llama, jornada especial, porque precisamente cuando se dio mucho el tema acá de la violencia, pues las mujeres asumieron ese rol de trabajo en la finca y el rol de ser mamá y estar en casa, entonces a veces eh, para un día para que ellas pudieran atender. Bueno, en el tema de la salud, de, la, de que las mujeres se ausentan más, y sí me hubiese gustado de pronto que, o una recomendación, porque eh, cogieron dos fincas, y en dos fincas creo que no puede quedar como que eso es lo que, lo que se da. Creo que en el sector bananero eh, hay menos mujeres en el tema de ausentismo por enfermedad que los hombres. Por ende, porque los hombres son más caros. Nosotros tenemos un porcentaje de mujeres del 8.3%. Entonces se va a ver pues, que va, van a haber mucho más hombres enfermos que las mismas mujeres. Eh, en ese caso, cuando una mujer está incapacitada, porque realmente a veces tiene problemas serios ya con el tema de gaste, de, de mango rotador o o túnel, o algunas enfermedades, pero, pero en nuestro quehacer diario, que estamos en, en, en todo este proceso constantemente, miramos pues como que el tema de, la, de las mujeres es menos incapacitante que, que los hombres. Nosotros a través de, de nuestras negociaciones con los empresarios bananeros hemos venido haciendo un proceso para incrementar el número de mujeres en las fincas, que más mujeres estén trabajando porque son... No, 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 no está el porcentaje que de pronto quisiéramos que hubiese en la finca. Por eso el sector y el sindicato eh, ha venido haciendo un trabajo de que en las convenciones colectivas se, se metan cláusulas para que las mujeres sean contratadas. Eh, se ha encontrado, eh, digamos que en algunos casos podemos decir que el 70% ha cumplido, de pronto un 30%, pues todavía no, no, no llega a cumplir el proceso, pero lo estamos haciendo. Igualmente, eh, con contratos, que verdaderamente, pues este contrato, las mujeres tengan un salario que le justifique el, el trabajo, pero que también puedan eh, resolver el tema de sus familias. Además de eso, hemos contratado en muchos convenios con otras empresas, eh, aparte de las negociaciones, para hacer un contrata, una contratación muy significativa que fue en el 2019. Entonces, en ese caso, creo que yo sé que usted hace una investigación y puede al azar unas fincas, de pronto, mmm, no sé, no, tampoco pues se nos consultó, digamos, como a la dirigencia sindical, pero bueno, yo sé que de pronto lo hacen ustedes así porque eh, para de pronto tener este estudio y por eso hoy lo estamos, se está socializando. Entonces creo que en ese caso, eh, que también resulta muy, muy, muy significativo el tema del acoso sexual en la finca, pero también el acoso laboral para las mujeres. También es, es bastante importante que todo eso, esto se tenga pues, como en cuenta. Eh, más mujeres en la empacadora, por ende, sí, lo, las mujeres, las labores que las mujeres hacen son más en la empacadora. Son pocas las mujeres que hacen labores de campo por, por el grado de, de complejidad que a veces se tiene y por la misma condición de la mujer. Entonces, por eso hay más mujeres en la empacadora y muchos hombres pues, en el campo que son los que cortan los racimos y hacen todo el proceso de, de, de mantenimiento de la, de la finca, son hombres. Son muy pocas las mujeres que van al campo, a, a no ser que cuando van a hacer abono, pero que también es complejo porque un bulto de abono pesa 50 kilos y entonces para una mujer a veces le queda muy pesado. Entonces, como este tipo de labores y algunas otras labores como el de soja y que también en algunas empresas pues también utilizan algunas mujeres para realizar esta labor. Creo que el estudio de 2004, que fue un estudio que hicimos nosotros como organización sindical, conjuntamente con la, con la Escuela Nacional Sindical, 
donde hicimos un estudio de, sobre derechos se, eh, laborales, sexuales y reproductivos de las trabajadoras en el sector bananero, pero eh, ese es un estudio que sí, como tú dices, ya hace 18 años, pero lo estamos incluso, yo acabo de hacer un estudio también y actualizamos mirando el antes y el después, cómo estaban las mujeres en el 2004 y cómo están a 2021, que lo, lo, lo culminamos ahorita en 2022, entonces hicimos esas comparaciones con el tema de la, de, de, del tema de la contratación de mujeres, porque ha sido pues como uno de los pilares fundamentales de la organización sindical y que lo hemos llevado a las negociaciones conjuntamente con los, con los empresarios, y sé que eh, muchos empresarios, pues, han avalado esta, esta participación de mujeres, más mujeres en la empresa, porque muchas mujeres cabezas de familia que requieren tener también un sustento para, eh, para ellos. Entonces, creo que valioso pues el estudio que se hace, pero eh, sé que faltan muchos elementos para poder llegar al tema de salario digno, con, con el tema de, de lo que hoy tenemos, como te digo, el, el, el estudio que se... Que, que hice el año pasado, haciendo la comparación, pero sí, sí, en el tema salarial es eso. ¿Por qué la brecha salarial? Porque las mujeres no trabajan todos los días, pero en materia de, de día de pago se gana igual que el hombre. Es, es eso. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Adela. Eh, no sé si Luisa o Sally tienen algún comentario para, para Adela. Uh, creo que hay dos elementos. Eh, para, para aclarar eh, respecto a, a la presentación y a los días eh, de los días remunerados, sea por enfermedad o sea por licencia. Y es um, algo que menciona Adela es que eh, en algunas otras fincas el ausentismo masculino es superior al femenino. Y eso es cierto, eh, pero también es cierto que ese ausentismo no está relacionado con pago. Eh, en el caso de los hombres, el ausentismo masculino eh, está relacionado con el hecho de que los días, uh, el lunes después del día de pago, eh, los trabajadores suelen no asistir a las, a las plantaciones y la ausencia no es justificada. O sea, simplemente... Eh, lo que dicen es que uh, se gastan todo su salario en el fin de semana y eh, pues no llegan porque estaban de fiesta, básicamente. Y eso no se observa en estas gráficas porque estas gráficas están basadas en los días que las empresas reconocen como pagos justificados por enfermedad o por alguna otra razón. Entonces, por eso aparecen las diferencias en los días, pero gracias a Adela por mencionarlo porque esto debía, debía haberlo eh, hecho más claro durante la presentación. Eh, y otro, otro aspecto que también menciona Adela frente a esta segregación de, de trabajos de hombres y de mujeres, eh, también debía haberlo mencionado antes y gracias a Adela por señalarlo, es que uh, incluso para algunos coordinadores y para eh, parte del personal administrativo todavía es impensable pensar en alternativas para que las mujeres participen en el campo. Y era lo que Adela mencionaba eh, previamente sobre eh, que las mujeres están concentradas principalmente en, eh, en, las, en las labores de, de empaque y en esto... Eh, pues esta segunda parte en la que Sal iba a presentar las recomendaciones del estudio, creo que Adela se adelantó un poco a esos a esas elementos que están incorporados en las recomendaciones. Eh, pues eh, simplemente eh, para decir que todavía hay, hay trabajo por, por hacer en ese aspecto y en eso es clave no solo el papel de Sintra y Nagro, sino también el papel de CLAC. Eh, principalmente porque eh, en el Magdalena, donde las fincas son un poco más pequeñas y quizás los recursos para este tipo de capacitación son menores, eh, tampoco hay una eh, presencia tan masiva de eh, los sindicatos. Entonces, CLAC puede ser un, un agente importante eh, para ayudar a corregir eh, este tipo de, de estereotipos. No sé si, Sally, tienes algunos comentarios adicionales. 
No, I mean, I think, uh, you know, very, very pertinent and helpful comments from Adela, but I, I think you're right, Louisa. I mean, some of the, the um, points that you've touched on, Adela, are things that we have taken into consideration in the recommendations and also are highlighting as best practices or good practices rather. Um, so perhaps that will be reflected in the next section of the presentation. Um, I mean, I think, I think it's, but it, this, the point about um, whether the two case studies are representative of the sector. Um, I mean, I think we are very clear that this is, we, we're not claiming that they are representative. Um, the number of sick days, as Louisa has spoken about, there's a difference between the unauthorized and authorized absences. Um, but even if even if the number of sick days, paid sick days, uh, um, are not representative or not typical, should we say, um, that was a very small factor in the gender pay gap. Um, I think if it had been something that we thought was a really major factor, we wouldn't. We would have, you know, maybe been more cautious in the, we, the way we were presenting that because, as you say, there are just case studies. But um, I think a combination of those two, uh, the two aspects that it's, it's not having a major impact on the gender pay gap and also um, we weren't accounting for unauthorised absences. Um, we didn't feel that there was a need to, to kind of ignore those results, if you like. Um, but I think, yeah, other than that, just, you know, very useful comments for, for everybody in the room to hear. Emerson? Sí, por favor, ahora podemos pasar al señor Emerson Aguirre. Camila, muchas gracias. Eh, Luisa, un gusto saludarte. Muy interesante el estudio. Un, unas preguntas muy puntuales. Primero, ¿la finca en La Guajira es sindicalizada? La que se analizó. Segundo, en la introducción cuando se realiza, se habla que únicamente se contempla empleo formal cuando se paga pensión. ¿Por qué no se tiene en cuenta también cuando se habla del pago de cesantías? Teniendo en cuenta que nuestra legislación laboral colombiana tiene pensión, cesantías y para fiscalidad. Mm -hmm. El tercero, la, la diferencia, o dentro del estudio lo contemplaron, presentar la diferencia salarial entre una mujer de La Guajira y una mujer de Urabá, porque no lo veo en el estudio. Y lo tercero, acudiendo a las palabras que menciona Adela y que ustedes han mencionado, si es válido hacer una encuesta para complementar este estudio, si realmente hay interés alto, mediano o bajo de aumentar la participación desde las mujeres ¿sí? en las actividades en campo. Sería muy importante hacer esa encuesta. Muchas gracias. Eh, ok, Emerson, respecto a la finca en Guajira, sí tiene un eh, sindicato. En cuanto a lo que dices de seguridad social, um, en términos de mercado laboral, uh, cuando la firma hace los aportes a salud y a pensiones, eh, normalmente eso se considera formalidad y cuando esas dos cosas se pagan, indirectamente eh, cesantías también, también se están pagando. Entonces no significa que, que, no se, que estas empresas o que en general la definición omita la existencia de las cesantías, si existen. Frente a las diferencias entre cuánto gana una mujer en promedio en Urabá y en Guajira, no hicimos el cálculo explícito y no analizamos esas diferencias porque finalmente estos son casos de estudio, el número de mujeres es pequeño, es, para esto sería más interesante un estudio mucho más amplio y recordemos que este era un primer piloto para verificar si la metodología funcionaba o no. Pero en los cuadros tú puedes ver eh, en el reporte esos salarios promedio de mujeres en ambas, en ambas eh, empresas, entonces se podría hacer perfectamente el cálculo. Lo que pasa es que hay que tener cuidado con la interpretación de ese valor porque no es representativo entre las regiones. Uh, y finalmente, en términos de las encuestas uh, de interés por eh, las actividades, eh, repíteme, porfa, eh, si, si las mujeres quieren trabajar más, menos horas o en distintas actividades de campo, ¿correcto? Sí, si quieren aumentar la participación o, o si les llama la atención o cómo es el grado de de llamarle la atención de entrar en esas actividades donde su presencia no es tan alta. 
Sí, actividades de... No de, es masivo. De, 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 la respuesta sobre, o sea, si sí indagamos en esto, en, en las entrevistas en campo, y el interés no es masivo, pero pensando en estrategias para mejorar el balance de género a largo plazo, eh, no importa que sea masivo el interés. Si es pequeño, lo que uno puede pensar es en estrategias para incorporar a estas mujeres que sí tienen interés en las actividades de campo y en la medida en que vayamos incorporando a estas mujeres a esas actividades, ellas liberan un cupo que también puede ser aprovechado por nuevas contrataciones eh, por parte de las empresas y así mejorar el balance de género. Entonces, hay algunas que dicen, mire, yo prefiero estas actividades, sobre todo porque esto me evita eh, los problemas de... Eh, potenciales chismes o habladurías en, eh, en empaque. Entonces, sí existe el interés, pero no es masivo. Muchas gracias. Con gusto. Eh, César. Can I, can I just, can I just ah, sorry. clarify one thing? No. Um, I, maybe I, I misunderstood what you said, um, Luisa, but. Um, If the question was whether the, the plantation in Guajira was unionized, the answer is no. I think, Luisa, you said that yes, it is unionized, uh, but that that's the, the, the plantation in Uruba is unionized and the plantation in, in Guajira was not unionized. I just wanted to make sure that okay. was clear. Thank you for clarifying that. And, and just to add on to what you said about, you know, women's interest in doing field activities, um, And I think this is something that comes up again and again in any kind of um, gender study in agriculture um, is, you know, some kind of ideas that, you know, maybe women, it, women don't want to do field work because it's harder. It's, you know, sometimes exposed to the sun. Um, sometimes they're physically, you know, less able to do it. Um, and, and, you know, all of those reasons are valid and it's, and it's not that we would ever say that, that women should be getting forced into <laughs> to doing work that they don't want to do. Um, but what we are saying is that there are some barriers that are created not only from, um, you know, the, the way, things like, for example, the example of the, of the certification standards that puts limits on, on the type of work that women do, um, or can put limits on the type of work that people, that women do. Um, but there are also limits that people place on themselves without knowing um, that, that are derived from, you know, the way things have always been done, um, the, a belief in the, the ability of men and women uh, to do certain types of work. Um, in the same way that it's often said that, you know, women make better parents or better mothers, uh, you know, it's well proven that men can look after babies <laughs> as well as women can look after babies. And it's the same, I think, for a lot of the, the kind of differentiation of activities um, in agriculture. You can go to another country where women will be much more engaged in field work. Um, field activities and so you know yes there are preferences and yes there are physical differences that we're not trying to deny but there are also other aspects that that could be addressed through through questioning some of these assumptions and that's really what we're trying to say so next question Cesar Sí, eh, buenos días a todos y a todas. Yo quisiera hacer una pregunta con relación a cuál fue el motivo dentro del estudio que no se tomó en cuenta a la dirigencia sindical de Sintra Inagro, que es una organización sindical muy representativa en Colombia y que tiene eh, negociaciones colectivas donde ha mejorado las condiciones laborales de hombres y mujeres. Esa sería una de las preguntas. La otra es si dentro del estudio pudieron establecer las horas de trabajo en ordinaria y extraordinaria que ejecutan las trabajadoras y eh, en la finca donde mencionó la Guajira, que no hay sindicato, cuál es la jornada tanto ordinaria y extraordinaria y si se cumple con esos límites que eh, establece la ley. Porque eh, cuando veo el grupo también que se tomó en cuenta para este estudio, lo veo que les, el grupo fue muy pequeño, de una cantidad de trabajadores bananeros de Colombia, que es 
eh, el cuarto país eh, más eh, productor de banano, o tercero o cuarto país más productor de banano de Latinoamérica. Entonces, eh, como que se quedó muy chico el, el número de, de trabajadoras que se tomó en cuenta para ese estudio, ya que también sabemos que, que las trabajadoras, pues como bien lo dijo Adela, no trabajan todos los días, porque eso va a depender de que la empresa tiene eh, solicitudes de más mercado. Entonces, cuando se abre el mercado y hay más mercado, por lo tanto, las trabajadoras van a trabajar más días a la semana. Entonces, puede ser que eso vaya a incrementar un poco, pero eh, la situación que yo quería saber es esa parte, porque sabemos que en lo que es Eurabá, pues ya se encuentra regulado alguna de las condiciones, pero si ustedes encontraron ese tipo de, de diferencia entre una y otra. César, eh, no, no tengo muy claro cuál es la razón por la cual afirma que no consideramos a Sintra Inagro. De hecho, entrevistamos a Adela eh, para entender un poco mejor cuáles eran todas estas acciones y la forma en la que las llevaban a cabo y las monitoreaban en el caso de la finca ubicada en Urabá. Y eh, todas las acciones positivas presentes en la convención colectiva eh, están expuestas eh, dentro del trabajo. En términos de las horas trabajadas, quizás esto por mi inglés no se entendió muy bien, pero lo que mencioné es que nosotros analizamos fue días trabajados y esto tiene una razón, y es que la jornada de ley se aplica, pero en los días de empaque, eh, cuando el empaque es bajo, ellos pueden salir más, las personas pueden salir más temprano. Entonces ellos no mantienen un récord de exactamente cuántas horas de la jornada legal de trabajo eh, efectivamente se trabajan, sino que ellos solo cuentan las horas extras que tienen que pagar de acuerdo a la ley y que están reflejadas en los datos de nómina que nosotros recibimos. Y esos son los datos, no sé si Camila te puedas devolver un poquito a las brechas y a la desagregación de las brechas por tipo de trabajo, barras verde, esta. Um, gracias a, a que las, los, las horas extra o el tiempo de horas extra está registrado en los datos de nómina, es que nosotros podemos calcular estas eh, barras del segundo bloque, que son el pago de, de tiempo extra de, de los trabajadores. Pero en términos de las horas totales de trabajo no podemos hacer un cálculo porque si bien está establecida una jornada de ley de 8 a 5, eh, los trabajadores en días de empaque de baja demanda pueden estar saliendo a las 2 o 3 de la tarde, que fue lo que nosotros observamos en campo. No sé si eso responda la la pregunta de, de las horas trabajadas. Y en términos de días, gracias eh, Camila, si podemos volver a los días trabajados, estas barras horizontales, es cierto que las mujeres trabajan menos días eh, y eso está relacionado con que no todos los días se hace empaque, pero algo sorprendente es que eh, cuando usted compara eh, los trabajadores eh, hombres con mujeres y hombres están trabajando también en campo, la diferencia tampoco es mucha. Eh, y eso ocurre en ambas, en ambas empresas, eh, a pesar de que tienen diferentes eh, días de empaque eh, en ambos casos. No sé si eso resuelva sus inquietudes, César. Sí, tal vez alguna parte. Eh, no sé cómo ve usted con relación a la eh, cuando se hace este tipo de estudio, el, el número al que se, al que se llegó. Ah, ok. Gracias por, gracias por recordarlo. Eh, algo que quizás tampoco fue claro en la presentación es que este es un primer piloto de la metodología. Eh, eh, Sally mencionó al principio cuando mostró el mapa los distintos sitios en donde se están haciendo estos pilotos. Entonces, Parte de nuestro interés era perfeccionar la metodología, sobre todo esa relación entre la información de nómina y las preguntas que íbamos a hacer en campo, que también está relacionada con la intervención anterior. Eh, y esa es la razón por la que en este momento se seleccionaron dos fincas, pero claramente eh, si este trabajo es de interés, algo que deberíamos hacer a futuro es eh, ampliar eh, el número de, de fincas participantes en estos estudios. Estoy de acuerdo con usted. 
Muchas gracias. Sally, no sé si tienes algún otro comentario. Um, no, but uh, Camilla has just flagged that we've only got 15 minutes left. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I think if it's if it's possible um, to just present the recommendations um, and then any further questions um, could perhaps Tenemos go in, in the chat. Tenemos una mano más levantada que es la de Iris, entonces si quieres yo le respondo a ella vía chat y Iris es tan amable de, de escribirnos su pregunta a través del chat, yo la respondo. Yeah, and, and, and if we have just five minutes at the end, if I, I'll try and kind of go through the recommendations quite quickly, um, and perhaps we can give an opportunity to Iris to, to comment first. So yes, I think I think we should um, proceed with the 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 last few slides. Um, so I think it's really important to say, you know, and some of this has come up already um, in the commentary that that we identified quite a number of good practices in the Colombian banana industry. Um, and this was not only our case study um, companies, but also um, from the stakeholder workshop, um, at, as well as the general kind of literature around the sector. Um, and so we really wanted to, to, you know, highlight these good practices as, as things that are already being done. You know, they're, they're tried and tested, if you like. Um, and certainly could be relevant for other companies um, in Colombia, but elsewhere um, as well, other parts of the world. Um, so some of these things we've already talked about, um, the fact that the um, most workers were on permanent contracts, including workers who are on these special shifts, um, and also that the collective bargaining agreement guarantees a minimum of three days of work for workers on special shift contracts. These are certainly very good practices that you wouldn't always see in, in this kind of sector. Um, the, the fact that workers are trained in different activities to be multi multifunctional. Um, I mean, that has more of a benefit for men in the sense that men are trained across um, both packing activities and field activities. And so they have a greater ability to increase their wages, if you like, by increasing the number of days worked and the number of activities that they engage in. But nevertheless, it's beneficial for both uh, men and women because it means that they can earn more. They can do things other than just packing. Um, this uh, one of the, the farms had created an apprentice coordinator role um, specifically in order to try and um, encourage women into those management positions, the key management positions, um, and that was working effectively. Um, there were some explicit actions uh, that have been spoken about in the collective bargaining agreement um, to, to promote women's participation in the sector. Um, and also some companies had, uh, had tried, you know, hiring or specifically um, identifying jobs that, that they were targeting women for as a way to um, promote women's employment. Um, the, the, the occupational health and safety offices that Louisa referred to as being a kind of part of national regulation, um, that, that's a really good practice so long as the promotion of gender equality and a good working environment is included as part of their responsibilities, which, would it, which it was in the case of our case study companies. Um, and that's something that we think, you know, is, a, is a, a, a good way to mainstream a focus on and a kind of ongoing focus on, on gender equality in the workplace. Um, and then um, there was an example of a company, um, an exporter that was um, monitoring, actually monitoring wages very in a very detailed way to ensure that workers were earning a living wage um, and looking at this on an individual work, worker basis. And, and uh, as we have said in our presentation, you know, achievement of a living wage is a gendered um, issue uh, because it is the case that fewer women achieve a living wage currently um, in, in our case study companies than, than men. Um, and this is the same, we're finding this in other, pay, pay, uh, other of the pilot studies as well. Um, and so this practice of, of monitoring wages um, is, is certainly something we would see as a good practice, um, as long as it's also recognized that there's a gen gender aspect to it. So next slide, please. And then, so then we, there were also some recommendations that are really derived from the, from the broader analysis, the statistical analysis and, and um, other, other analysis that, that we did. 
Um, and one of those is this uh, the need to really um, cross check that uh, that the pay rates for different activities have been decided in a gender neutral way. Um, it's very common around the world um, for the types of work that women to, to do to be valued less than the types of work that men do. Um, and, you know, it, it, we don't we didn't look at it, this in that much detail. And it may well be that in in the case of Colombia, because you have a collective bargaining agreement, that the pay rates have been um, agreed in a, or decided on in a gender neutral way. But we would suggest that the sector could do a, um, a, a gender um, neutral job evaluation of all the typical activities in banana plantations, looking at things like the skill level, the type of responsibility, the um, uh, the kind of physicality of work and, and other aspects of the activity to to assign it a value. And there are, there are methodologies for doing this that, that are, are well known, um, but it is quite a comprehensive job to do. And it was beyond the scope of our value. Uh, uh, beyond the scope of our study but that that really is where you would get to equal pay for work of equal value um, as Adela very rightly said uh, women are not being paid differently for the same activity um, from men um, but it is possible we don't know um, that women are paid or, or the work that women does is valued less than the work that that, that men do so that's something we think should be looked at um, there are a lot of training programs in place, lots of good practices around, around training um, at the companies that we looked at, um, but also that we heard of more generally in the sector. Um, and we just feel that some of those training programs could be expanded. Um, so training women in field activities, as, as we've talked about already, um, that's something that kind of is beyond uh, women's imagination sometimes, but you know, there are women who are, are interested. Um, extending the training on um, gender stereotypes and sexual harassment and other forms of gender-based violence is necessary because there are ongoing issues with that. Um, training women, this, the, the, uh, it was raised that there's a perception that women, um, if there's too many women working together, there's conflict um, in the pack house and, and that women, you know, can't get along. Um, and, you know, a lot of that appears to be based on, you know, stereotypes, some of it may be based on reality. Um, nevertheless, training on conflict resolution, we think would be useful way to address that and to start addressing attitudes towards um, uh, hiring women in large numbers. Um, and then also the trying to address this issue of women being still being kind of less able to participate actively and effectively in workers committees and associations um, and that is something that um, has already been worked on and we just think it needs it needs further further attention um, clarifying the requirements of certification standards is an obvious thing to do which I think would be quite a straightforward thing to do uh, just to make sure that there isn't a barrier to women's employment um, where there shouldn't be next slide please and and then and then perhaps some more things that are that are you know some of these perhaps more controversial um so you know currently we don't believe that women have equal opportunities as men uh, to participate in field activities um for various reasons and so there is an argument that most packing activities should be reserved for women um, without at the same time introducing barriers that would be discriminatory, discriminatory against other types of workers. For example, men who are um, have long-term physical disabilities, often as a result of the work in the field, are reassigned into the pack house. And those men should always have that opportunity, obviously, to continue their employment. Um, but we do think that there is a case to be made until such time as there are equal opportunities for women to have preference in the pack house. Um, also, another perhaps controversial uh, recommendation would be to look at the balance of re remuneration for pack, packing activities um, and other activities that women are engaged in, such as cleaning, with respect to re remuneration for field work, which, which pays at a higher rate if you're looking at the kind of amount earned for a regular working day. Um, and then, and it, this also kind of links back to the to the job, uh, the, doing a, an evaluation of jobs, a proper evaluation of jobs to make sure that there's um, equal pay for work of equal value. Uh, 
Um, one thing that Louisa talked about and Adela also raised uh, about this causes of absenteeism for women and for men, we picked up that there are different causes um, and that therefore that means that there are different um, solutions to try and reduce absenteeism. Um, and the, the you know, very common cause of absenteeism amongst women is that their family responsibilities and um, uh, the need for women to have greater access, for example, to uh, flexible types of working arrangements or emergency care leave, emergency leave, sorry, for, for care work um, is something that could be looked at as a way to mitigate that. Uh, more generally, we feel like there should be more monitoring of wages broken down into the types of activities performed and the type of um, the time worked so that we can really kind of get, as we've repeatedly said, you know, data that is beyond two case studies that we've looked at, um, data that's relevant for the whole sector um, to have a better understanding of, of causes of gender pay gaps. Um, and then to, to, to really start trying to address these things, you know, have, have in companies planning horizons a strategy to address the, the main causes of gender pay gaps that is in accordance with the, the, cap, the capacities of each company and, and their specific um, situations. We would like to see the pilot extended to Magdalena department. Um, and uh, that's because we were told by stakeholders that, that the conditions are quite different, uh, that not only they have smaller plantations um, and, uh, you know, small producer organization type plantations, um, there is pot potentially a different kind of forms of employment there that should be looked at if we want to have a better view of the sector. And then finally, um, this question of, of looking at the, um, the link between wages and production cycles and, and gender pay gaps. We were only able to do that to a very limited extent. We didn't have extensive data on production and demand. And we think that this is a really important aspect to look at and so that we can kind of link this all back to markets and, and look at the solutions that might be um, linked to how supply chains operate. So those are our kind of top recommendations. Uh, I'm very sorry that we haven't got more time to discuss them because it would have been very useful to hear people's views. Uh, but if we have got a few minutes and anyone's willing to stay a bit longer, um, I'm sure Louisa and I would be very happy to answer any questions and or hear any other suggestions. Thank you, Sally. Perhaps maybe we can see if Iris still has a question. Uh, Iris, eh, si todavía tiene una pregunta, le quiere, quisiéramos darle la palabra a usted por si quiere hacer la pregunta que tenía anteriormente. Iris, ¿no se escucha? ¿A quién, Camila? Disculpa. No, sí, le estaba, de, le estaba dando la palabra en caso de que todavía quiera hacer su comentario o pregunta cuando había levantado la mano anteriormente. Bueno, sí. Eh, buenos días a todos y todas. Iris Munguía de Honduras. Este, a mí me parece que eh, son importantes, ¿verdad? Todos los estudios que se hacen y más en este sentido cuando estamos hablando de un estudio sobre la, eh, la brecha de género, la brecha salarial, ¿verdad? Tal vez yo entré un poquito tarde y tal vez no escuché bien eh, los términos que se tomaron en cuenta para, o las referencias o los elementos que se tomaron en cuenta para definir el salario vital o se tomó como referente el salario digno de OIT, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, a mí me parece bien importante y en todo esto me están quedando dos elementos que me parece que son importantes para, eh, para nosotras como mujeres. Porque cuando, es, a mí me parece que es un buen punto cuando hablamos de, de comparar los días trabajados. Porque desde ahí estamos mirando que eh, las mujeres nos beneficiamos o tenemos menos garantías, podemos decir. Menos garantías en cuanto a, a, a los días trabajados. Por ejemplo, si nosotras en, la, en el departamento de empaque solo hay dos días corte a la semana, solo dos días trabajamos, ¿verdad? Entonces los otros cuatro días eh, no tenemos garantizados los días como lo tienen garantizados los compañeros. Porque los compañeros eh, tienen garantizado sus seis días a la semana. Cuando no trabajan en el empaque, entonces se los mandan a trabajar a la agricultura. Entonces, por lo menos allí 
está garantizando cuatro días de salario para los hombres. Entonces, nosotras como mujeres, yo creo que es importante ese punto porque eh, tenemos que ir buscando también, ¿verdad?, dentro de los contratos colectivos, eh, la garantía de los días trabajados para las mujeres, porque si hay actividades que nosotras como mujeres podemos hacer en el campo, y ya lo hemos hecho en reiteradas eh, ocasiones, por ejemplo, el, el corte de la maleza que le dicen conde, eh, el fertilizante, aplicar fertilizante, pero habría que discutirlo un poco también con las certificadoras, no sé por qué dentro de sus criterios eh, lo miran desde el punto de vista de, de la reproducción de las mujeres. Yo estoy de acuerdo que una mujer ya con, con meses avanzados de embarazo no puede ir a la agricultura, estoy de acuerdo porque los terrenos son un poco arcillosos y, y hay, y hay algunos, algunas cuestiones, pero me parece que eh, dentro del empaque, si hay trabajo en el empaque, a la mujer se le puede garantizar el trabajo eh, dentro del mismo empaque, ¿verdad? si hay trabajo, pero a veces también hay trabajo en el empaque, pero como hay una rotación de trabajo, entonces de repente van a trabajar los hombres, pero las mujeres no vamos a trabajar al empaque. Entonces yo creo que son cosas que las tenemos que ir analizando y las tenemos que ir planteando y, y hablando con los, con los mismos empresarios, ¿verdad? Para mirar desde qué punto de vista eh, se puede ir mejorando esa situación. Pero me parece interesante esto, esto porque por lo menos lo deja bien claro, ¿verdad? Eh, el estudio. La otra cosa que me parece que sí hay que tomar en cuenta es... Mmm, la, la, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo comparamos? Donde hay sindicato y donde no hay sindicato, ¿verdad? También sobre las condiciones de las mujeres, porque eso también es importante eh, para que sirva como referencia, pues, eh, también, porque aquí lo que estamos buscando es cómo vamos mejorando, cómo hay, cómo hay buenas prácticas, cómo las vamos poniendo en... en en proceso en diferentes países, entonces eh, eso es lo elemental, porque por ejemplo aquí en Honduras, la mayoría de las que trabajamos en el empaque son, son mujeres, estamos hablando que si aquí hay un personal de 200 mujeres, 150 o 170 son mujeres y, y, y 30 son hombres, ¿verdad? Entonces la mayoría son mujeres las que trabajan en, aquí en el departamento de empaque, pero en agricultura trabajan solo hombres, ¿verdad?, entonces, solo han habido ocasiones que nos han mandado como mujeres, digamos, a trabajar a la, a la finca, pero por casos de necesidad o cuando o algún huracán, alguna cuestión que las mujeres han quedado completamente sin trabajo, entonces le buscan una solución desde ese punto de vista. Pero sí me parece que, que, que quedan algunos elementos con los que hay que ir eh, trabajando también ahí. Bueno, en términos del salario de referencia, Iris, eh, ya el Instituto Anker había hecho un cálculo de los salarios vitales para, para la región de, de Magdalena, Antioquia y Guajira. Entonces, ese fue el que se usó como referencia para el cálculo de, de salarios eh, dignos. Eh, en cuanto a días trabajados, eh, estamos de acuerdo y quizás esa es la razón por la cual en las recomendaciones Sally eh, hace mucho énfasis en indagar las razones del, de estos ausentismos. O sea, ten, las empresas normalmente mantienen un récord de esa información, pero esa información no se utiliza eh, para promover medidas que eh, eviten que las mujeres tengan que, eh, pues, tener estas ausencias eh, en el trabajo y en términos de los días de trabajo que se garantizan eh, para hombres y mujeres, usted tiene razón, es importante asegurar igualdad de condiciones en esos, en esos días trabajados y no solo los días de empaque porque siempre eh, en esos casos, dependiendo de la demanda, eh, las mujeres van a tener una desventaja. Eh, y en cuanto a lo de las certificadoras, como Sally lo mencionó eh, también en, 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 sus, en la presentación de las recomendaciones del estudio, eh, sí eh, parece que habían errores en la interpretación de la norma eh, que han sido discutidos por parte de las organizaciones, eh, pero todavía no es masiva eh, la aclaración 
de esas de, de cómo opera la norma la norma realmente y es importante que no solo lo conozca la administración sino que también lo conozcan los trabajadores como usted lo menciona porque solo con el conocimiento los trabajadores pueden hacer un enforcement de la posibilidad real que existe para las mujeres de participar en estas actividades que históricamente participaban y ahora están un poco eh, marginadas por efecto de, de, estas, de estas nuevas regulaciones. Entonces, completamente de acuerdo con lo que están mencionando de, de los días trabajados y de las certificadoras. No sé si, Sally, tienes algún comentario extra respecto a la intervención de Iris. No, I don't think so. I know we're running over time, so um, we should probably uh, see whether people want to stay on for a bit longer. Obviously, some, a lot of people have already had to leave. Um, Camila, do you want to just check in? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, there were some other comments that I think were translated in English and Spanish in, in, in the chat, so I think the participants were able to read through those. There was just one more question regarding which company was the one that had that was uh, unionized and the one that was not. So, uh, one specifically about Sintra Inagro, apologies, which one was Agura and Sintra Inagro, company A or B? is what the, this is what they were asking, but I guess, yeah, I'm not sure that this can be shared. Yeah, I mean, we we intentionally didn't want the study to be a comparison of unionized and non-unionized plantations, um, you know, because it, that wasn't the focus of the study to understand the effect of unionization on the gender pay gap. Obviously, um, there are aspects that came up that were, Um, very much linked to whether the study was unionized or not, specifically in relation to the value of activities um, and, and the level of wages. Um, and I think it's, you know, well known that the wages in the Uraba um, area where the plantations are mostly unionized are higher um, than in other parts in the other departments. Um, so I think we, you know, without revealing anything, we can say that, uh, but we've speci specifically not kind of compared a unionized with a non-unionized plantation, because there are other factors that affect wages, as I set out in the in the opening comments. Um, you know, the, the local labor market dynamics, the local cost of living, all of these things can affect wages. And, and we didn't want to make this, um, because it wasn't the focus of the study, I think we would have had to do additional things Um, to really verify the, um, the influence of unionization on the gender pay gap vis-a-vis uh, -vis other things. And with just two case studies, it, it also wouldn't have been appropriate. So, so we're not revealing it directly, uh, but I think anyone that reads the report would probably be quite, would quite easily identify which company is which. Great, thank you, Sally. So I see that there were no other questions or uh, in the chat. And given that we've already run over, I think perhaps we can already run to the go to the closing remarks. So on behalf of the Anchor Research Institute, um, I wonder whether uh, perhaps we can give the floor to the anchors in, in case they'd like to give some closing remarks, and then we will just share a few words as well. Yeah, I mean, I, first of all, just to thank uh, Louisa and, and Sally for, for all this work and, and all this information. I mean, that's the first thing that's important to say. The, the other is that I, I think that, judging from the comments, I think there's some little bit of misunderstanding of the study in that the, the, the methodology in the study was to find out how, what the situation is in different companies. And it wasn't to generalize to the sector. I mean, obviously you always try and generalize whatever you can because everybody's interested in more generalized stuff. But I, I think that the, 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 the results you're seeing justify the approach and the methodology. And that is the companies were different, <laughs> these two companies, which meant that they had different gender pay gaps. They had different uh, determinants of the gender pay gap. And, and that's, the message which, which I take away, and, and I think it's important that, you know, breaking out administrative and operational type of workers, looking at occupations, the, the direct determinants, the degree to which the occupation is important or the day's work is important, you know, varied between the companies. And that's exactly what you want to know. 
uh, so that the companies can do something about it. The fact that, that, uh, that which makes the generalization to the sector more difficult. But I think that that's kind of the whole idea is that we're trying to see what each company can do and they're all different. So I think that's the first thing. The, the, the other, which I thought was quite interesting is that the, the higher pay does not necessarily mean lower gender pay gap. In this case, it was exactly the opposite. The, the one that paid more actually had a bigger gap. And so it's not, the, the two don't necessarily go together. And again, it's, it's an indication how important the different um, companies are. Uh, and the last thing, just um, to say that I think that when we come to the recommendations, and I think I think this, they were very, very interesting and very informative, that that's where I think people just have to take it for what it is, is that it's two intelligent researchers have come up with, from talking to people from two companies, what looks like generalizable uh, best practices, but it isn't like they've done a, a hundred uh, firms and there's all this stuff and generalized. So I, I think the the, the the study results are are exactly what we would have hoped that we can tell the difference between companies, which is really the purpose of this, and that based on some um, interviews, qualitative and knowledgeable people, uh, you can come up with what looks like recommendations, but. I think you have to be careful that those recommendations are just what they're saying. That they're, they're based on relatively small sets of, of, of discussions. But so anyway, the, the bottom line is a great job. And, and, I, and I think it's going in the direction that we were hoping it would go in terms of the methodology. And, and people shouldn't take away more from what we're doing than, than what we ever intended. Great, thank you very much, Richard <laughs> and Martha. So yes, I mean, on to conclude from, from the World Banana Forum Secretariat and we just wanted to thank all the organizations involved. So a special thanks to Sally and Louisa as well for the very detailed overview of the study and the results. I think it was really insightful for most of the participants and we're happy to see that there were some questions and also reflections from the, the, the participants also in the session today. Um, of course, to the Anchor Research Institute, Institute to Richard and Martha Anchor, um, Fairtrade Germany and CLAC as well for um, supporting in the process with the, with the World Banana Forum through the letter of agreement we had. We would also like to thank, of course, all of the participants that I still see we have many here um, participating. So thank you for staying the, the extra time. Um, and we really hope that you found the study, the methodology, and also the results insightful. Um, and of course, please feel free to let us know if there's any additional questions. We're also happy to forward those to the anchors, to Sally and Luisa. And finally, just to conclude, a very big thanks also to members of the World Banana Forum Secretariat who have been providing support with interpretation um, throughout this whole session. So a special thanks to David and um, Mattia for their support today. Um, again, yes, we would like to just express our, our thanks for all of the hard work that has been going on for this for the study. And we look forward to seeing um, how this will progress in terms of also the recommendations and also to see future studies um, in, in this area of work. So thank you again to everyone and we wish you all a, a nice rest of the day or a nice evening.